Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Well, I've, I, I was able to spit it out correctly this time. I think we're getting off to a good start. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody uh, in the chat room. And, and if you're here for the first time, I especially want to welcome you. Uh, and uh, for the regular uh, participants, we call you the congregation. Uh, thanks for joining us and and uh, to the, the moderators, uh, thank you for being there. And, uh, you know, we appreciate the job you do as moderators to uh, deal with the trolls and also welcome the, the newcomers. So I, your, your work is greatly appreciated. Um, before we get started with the study, uh, we're going to be doing our... First Corinthians uh, chapter five, beginning with verse one tonight. So go ahead and find that if you, if you have your Bibles. Uh, but before we get started, let's have some introductions. Uh, let's start with uh, the, the untwisted sister, Renee. Hey guys. So great to have you here. Uh, I wanted to uh, announce real quick before I forgot, I am gonna be doing a live program. Matthias has been kind enough to Offer to produce it on Thursday nights, the Thursday Theological Throwdown, and I will have alternating guests. Uh, so I will be contacting some of you to see if you'll join me on some nights. It will not be tomorrow, but we'll pick it up next week because my mom's here tomorrow. And I'm really excited. I really love going through the Pauline epistles because they do have so many soteriology verses, um, and they're very edifying. So I'm happy to be here tonight with everybody. All right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, if you are new to the congregation, um, Sister Renee's uh, channel is uh, named Renee Roland. I hope you go subscribe and click the notification button so you receive all her videos. Uh, her, her ministry is, is primarily focusing on um, helping people who struggle with uh, the, the gospel message that, of faith alone that the people are confused and thinking that some kind of religious works are required by us to get saved or to keep our salvation or to prove that we're really saved. So if you're uh, uh, struggling with that, you're having problems with some verses, uh, she untwists those verses so you can understand the context and, uh, and really understand and believe the real gospel. Uh, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Um, now, we also have Brother Cripps with us, Jason Cripps. Uh, tell him about your channel. If someone doesn't know you, what do you do? Hi, thanks, Brother Luke. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. And uh, we have a panel of uh, believers, and we have one uh, uh, professing unbeliever that uh, asks us questions, and we have discussions about that. And um, uh, we try to get to the bottom of uh, some of the things and um, just have an open dialogue. And I think we've proved that you can disagree about certain things and uh, still get along and treat each other with respect and dignity. And um, so that's uh, True Story Live. We also do testimonies um, and we have one tomorrow night. So if people want to listen to that at 9 p.m. Uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, his name is Dennis. So we'll have him with us. Um, also part of this show every Wednesdays, as you know, and I uh, uh, enjoy being a part of this panel and also on Talking Doctrine for Monday's Milk on Monday evenings. So I'm happy to be here and hello to everyone on the panel and to the chat. Hi, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so Talking Doctrine, I mean, not uh, Talking Doctrine, uh, True Story Live is the name of this channel. I hope you'll subscribe. Uh, we also have uh, Matthias uh, producing this program. Uh, would you like to say anything, Matthias, uh, about your channel? Or would you want to remain silent for the whole night? Well, I can chime in whenever need be, but um, but I'm eating my ice cream right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Matthias is um, producing the program, uh, and uh, his channel is Talking Doctrine. So I hope you'll subscribe also to his channel if you haven't already. Uh, he, better than anybody else I know, is uh, he, he conducts dialogues. He has some really interesting conversations with people. So if you want to have a conversation about theology, whether you agree or disagree with Matthias, uh, 
he'll have that friendly dialogue with you. So contact him for that. Um, and of course, I'm Brother Luke. My channel is hosting this tonight. It's Sin City Preacher. And uh, my focus primarily is sharing the gospel, but uh, I also have over 60 playlists on my channel on a wide range of theological subjects. So I think my channel now also can serve as a good resource for you. Uh, I hope you'll look through all the playlists. If you find a playlist of interest, take some time and hear me out. If you, uh, if you find some of my views uh, different, uh, some of them are. Uh, I hope you'll consider them. And uh, if you think I'm wrong, uh, go ahead and tell me how I'm wrong. As long as you're polite about it, I want to hear it. <laughs> All right, so let's get started with the uh, the study. First Corinthians chapter five, uh, chapter five, verse one. Can you pull it up for us, Thias? Okay. Um, now, some of you um, are not aware of this, but we're we're really uh, what we call KJV firstists. We want to read it in the KJV, but we're we're also uh, willing and eager to look at other translations if, if it might help us. So, the beginning with. Uh, verse 1 in the KJV, it reads, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Wow. First, Sister Renee? Yeah, I'm really glad we're finally getting to this section because the whole first Corinthians letter, every chapter, Paul is dealing with some kind of, uh, you know, trouble within the church, behavioral issue of not living and dealing with each other in a Christ like manner. And in a way that's becoming of saints. So this, this chapter, this whole book proves that just because you're saved doesn't mean the Holy Spirit forces you to live the way God wants us to live. And that it doesn't prove that if you're not living a certain <coughs> moral standard people choose, doesn't mean you're not saved. <coughs> One is absolutely has nothing to do with the other. One is experiential sanctification and the other is salvation. They are completely different. One from God did for us, the other is what we do in response to what God has done for us. So obviously the first thing here is, and he addresses this in the second Corinthian letter after it's been dealt with, but it says that it's reported commonly. So this is a common and, and known occurrence going on within and without the church. So they know this is happening with one of the brethren. So one of the brethren is having an affair, a sexual affair with his own father's wife or his stepmother. Okay, he's having a, an affair and everybody knows it. So it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you and such fornication and is not so much as named among the Gentiles. So even those that aren't in the covenant nation of Israel that people consider heathen don't even have a name for this kind of fornication because it's so horrible to have your own father's wife, your stepmother. This is what a saved brother is doing in the church. And he never once do you see him threaten the man's salvation or even call it into question. Not once. If you, you'll watch as we continue reading. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, um, I'd like to read this also in, in the Amplified before Brother Cripp's comments. So verse one in the Amplified reads, it is actually reported everywhere that there is sexual immorality among you, a kind of immorality that is condemned even among the unbelieving Gentiles, that someone has an intimate relationship with his father's wife. Brother Cripps? Yeah, I, I, I can't help thinking, uh, I, don't, I don't know what terminology they would, you would have used back then, but today they would put SMH for Paul. Paul. Paul, if he was responding via digital text message, would be saying SMH, shaking my head. Um, I'm sure he did shake his head when he got news of this. So it says it's it's gotten around to him. Uh, he got reports of this 
thing that's going on. And, and I love the way that Renee kind of painted a picture for what we're about to see. Um, so there's no real need for me to go into more detail because it's all going to come out of the next 12 verses. But um, particularly about this, uh, uh, so he's simply saying that he's uh, heard reports of this that are happening. He's accusing them of being puffed up. And um, he'll go into more detail about the, what that is. Um, and this thing that's being done isn't even done it's not a common thing among the Gentiles. So um, there's a lot of evidence coming up to support what Renee is saying and set up, and it wouldn't uh, do me any good to go over the same thing again. So I'll just say that there's a lot to look forward to here. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, I want to, let's read it in the NABRE. That's the New American Bible Revised Edition. <clears throat> uh, it says, it is widely reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of a kind not found even among pagans, mm. a man living with his father's wife. Mm. Um, I, I guess uh, when we compare that, uh, it says in KJV, it is commonly, it is reported commonly. In the NABRE, it says, is reported everywhere. And then in the NABRE, is widely reported so as Sister Renee points out that this is like well known by everybody, and yet uh, nobody's doing anything about it. It's not like it's some little secret, dirty little secret. <laughs> it's just they're 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 he, it's being done. It's being flaunted uh, right in, uh, under everybody's nose, and and yet nobody is uh, making any issue of it at all. Uh, let's look at the footnote in the. Uh, um, for verse one in the um, uh, Amplified, <clears throat> it says, um, <clears throat> some maintain that the man had married his stepmother. The, the marriage, if it occurred, was illegal and invalid by both Jewish and Roman law. So obviously uh, when it says his... Uh, He's having a relationship with his father's wife. That's not his actual mother. I don't think anybody interprets it that way. The interpretation is that it's his stepmother or it's someone that is, uh, uh, whether they actually got married legally. Obviously, they couldn't have gotten married legally. According to this, It's that's against Jewish and Roman law. Uh, no, I mean, no, I guess it's okay to get married, but to, to have that relationship for the son to have the relationship with his father's wife, I guess that's illegal in Roman and Jewish law. Let's look at the footnote in the uh, NABRE. Uh, this footnote is actually for five verse one, all the way through s s chapter six verse twenty. Uh, this is the point that that uh, the uh, this tra these translators are kind of summarizing what's going on in these two chapters. Come. Paul now takes up a number of other matters that require regulation. These have come to his attention by hearsay. And that's 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. It's hearsay, probably in reports brought by Chloe's people. Now, Chloe's people is in quotes because that's from 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11. And the significance of the term Chloe's people uh, we, we, we think that that's an important phrase there because Chloe had a prominent position in the church. And, and, and if it's Chloe's people, that means that it was the people who are meeting in her house and she was the leader of this people. It, it talks about, uh, uh, well, you have Apollos' people, you have uh, Peter's people, uh, uh, and, and you have, uh, here it says, Chloe's people. So uh, that should tell us something about uh, what they thought of uh, women being in charge of a congregation in their home. That's what it seems to be uh, saying to me and to others. Um, all right, let's go to... Uh, Brother Luke, I just yeah. wanted to say when they're talking about Chloe, they say, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, every time until they get to the woman, and then they say, we are of the house of Chloe. So they don't even say, oh, they try to make it less than what it actually is. They try to actually lessen her position by adding of the house of Chloe 
instead of just saying of Chloe uh, in the translation. I just wanted to let you know they do yeah. put their bias in the translation. Well, I think that uh, according to the footnote uh, in, in the NABRE, they do not do Right, that. right. They say Chloe's yeah. people, not right. in the house of Chloe. That's good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's let's go on and uh, read further in uh, the KJV verse two is, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Uh, Brother Cripps, you wanna go first on that one? Sure, so um, puffed up, I think we talked a little bit about what this means, so it's pride, they're, they're puffed up with their own pride of how, um, how good they are and, and all that. Um, so from this verse, and, and we've, I have the benefit of having talked about this before, so I know that, um, you know, that they didn't remove the, they didn't remove the guy, right? Um, so Paul's saying that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Um, so Paul's obviously seeing some things here that aren't being done correctly um, by the the standards that he he feels like it should have been uh, handled. And again, he's going to go into more detail about that. Um, I guess that's all I have for this one. Okay. All right. I'm going to read it in the. Um Amplified before you uh, comment, Renee. Verse 2 in the Amplified. And you are proud and arrogant. You should have mourned in shame so that the man who has done this disgraceful thing would be removed from your fellowship. Renee? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to answer that, but I, I need to address this. This is a Bible study and we try to stick to the topic of the scriptures we're studying and the little jab at us that as long as as long as nobody breaks the three core doctrines, you can call Jack Smack a fellowship a pedophile and everything's fine. We do not condone anybody slandering a brother in Christ, regardless whether we agree with any of their other doctrines or not. He is a brother. And even if he wasn't a brother. I don't condone anyone calling anybody names like that or slandering someone. These are very harmful things to say. And that's just, a, it's not the place for it to bring it into a Bible study and try to throw jabs at us. We're not trying to cause division. We're trying to study scripture here and nobody has ever condoned that kind of behavior. So that's just ridiculous to say. So, uh, and, uh, this verse, it's clearly saying, we see this uh, term puffed up in the prior chapter, and it's an implication that they feel like they have arrived. Not only are they arrogant, but they've arrived. They're fine. They're kind of resting on their laurels. Anything goes. And uh, he said, and have not rather mourned. They should be upset about this because it's giving the church as a whole a bad name. Just like when a major ministry does something terrible, like commits adultery, leaves their wife, and, and they're head of a, a great big church. It looks very bad. Now, the ones I've seen on TV, most of them aren't even, I wouldn't consider real brethren. They have another gospel, but the world doesn't know that. And so we shouldn't be uh, fellowshipping with, with some, that's this, this is so bad, even at that time, that the unbelievers are offended by it. So they should have dealt with this. And that's what Paul is saying that, that you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. You should be grieved over this, that this man has done this deed, should be out of this church. You should not be fellowshipping with him. He should have some consequence. He's not saying he'll lose his salvation. He's saying we can't tolerate this kind of behavior within the fellowship because it gives God, Jesus, a bad name as, as it does the brethren in the church as a whole. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, let me also comment uh, what Renee brought up in the chat room. Uh, this uh, Jesus loves me, uh, whatever it is, uh, that made that comment. Uh, Jesus loves me lots. I, I don't know who you are. Maybe it's someone who's a, been a problem in the past that just has created a new channel with a new name just so that you can try to stir up trouble. But uh 
I will say this, you're not going to be tolerated. And the, the chat room uh, in, in this congregation is, it, we don't allow people to come into the congregation and call other, anybody names. And also we don't allow anybody to come into the chat room and, and uh, argue against our core doctrines. Uh, but uh, uh, so I will say that I don't, this is a misrepresentation. Uh, there is nobody on this panel or there's nobody I know in this congregation that has said anything like that about Jack Smack. Uh, and uh, Jack Smack is one of my, probably my oldest friend on YouTube. Uh, we would never say anything like that, no, but not just that, but we wouldn't say anything that is hateful or a rude about others. We don't do that. You're the one that's bringing this into this. I know it's not going to be allowed. So, um, all right, now let's go to the, let's look at the footnote now in the, um, uh, in the um, NABRE uh, verse, uh, Verse five, five, verse two, down here, number C, Matthias five, two, it says, um, inflated with pride. This remark and the reference to boasting in First Corinthians five, six, suggests that they are proud of themselves despite the infection in their midst, tolerating and possibly even approving the situation. The attitude expressed in First Corinthians six, two, uh, and 13 may be influencing their thinking in this case. We haven't gotten that far yet, but uh, okay. So um, the problem here, P Paul is saying that, look, you, you, you should know better, and yet it doesn't seem to even bother you. Uh, you, you, you you're just ignoring it. You're not recognizing it or, or pointing out that as a, it's a problem and dealing with it. So Paul is going to deal with it. Uh, I guess we can go to verse three in the um, in the KJV now. It says, "For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed." In the I'm going to go to verse four also. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 5 also, to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So we know that Paul has some interesting style uh, of writing. He uses oratorical techniques. He uses long, long sentences. Uh, we got three verses here that's only one sentence. So verse three, four, and five, Sister Renee. Yeah, I want to clear something up here because a lot of people say destruction of his flesh, that the spirit may be saved, as if, if he doesn't change his ways because his flesh is destroyed, then he won't be saved. That's ridiculous. All Paul is saying is, well, he's he's gonna be he's gonna suffer. He's gonna be destroyed. He might even die if he doesn't stop this sinful thing. And his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. May doesn't mean oh might be. It's therefore will be or therefore can be. I just wanted to clarify that because people are trying to use anything they can to say you know to shake people's faith. So uh, he says, for verily as absent in the body but present in spirit. So Paul's saying I'm not physically there at that church. But I am spiritually there with you, and I've judged this already as if I was there concerning him that's done this with, you know, being having an affair with the stepmother. And he said, you know, he did, he's saying, I don't even need to be there to know how damaging this is to our church, to the church there in Corinth. And he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver, this is the instruction he's given. Turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So when a saved person does something wicked like this, they suffer temporally on this earth and often physically because of that sin. Again, sin brings death. But the wages of sin is death, and Christ paid the eternal death price for us. 
This is not talking about that kind of death. This is physical destruction. Okay. Just like Ananias and Sapphira. Um, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So uh, it's clear to me that the man remains saved, but he is going to suffer consequence here on this earth for what he's doing. And Paul has already judged it, although absent physically, he has judged it. He, is, he feels secure in his choice to instruct the believers to break fellowship over, turn him over to it and say, if you're going to choose to do this, we're going to turn you over to that sin. It's going to destroy you. We have to break fellowship. This is our judgment within the church. And he feels secure in instructing them to make that decision. All right. Uh, Brother Cripps, I'm going to read these three verses in the Amplified for you before you comment. Three, four, and five in the Amplified is, For I, though absent from you in body, but present in spirit, have already passed judgment on him who has committed this act, as if I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand over this man to Satan for the destruction of his body, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Brother Cripps? Yeah, thank you, Brother Luke. That, so, so this is really clear, and I'm glad Renee got a chance to, to answer first because I knew what she was going to say, and she didn't disappoint. So I'll double down on that in just a minute. But uh, so this is just simply him saying, look, I've judged this guy, even though I haven't been there, and this is what you should have done. Yeah, I mean, this is the way that you guys need to be reacting to the situation. I've done it. I didn't even need to be there to see it. I didn't need to see him face to face and do it myself, but I, he's already been in my mind. I, I've already judged him and this is what you should have done. Um, and the, the main point here is uh, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of its flesh. Now we know, and we've talked about on this, on these broadcasts about um, uh, uh, consequences that a believer will face if they choose to live like they say that we live, like we have some kind of license to sin. This is this is Paul bringing this up that we can look at it and and see that there are consequences for the flesh that we that that he might if he's turned over to Satan, his flesh might be destroyed. But the last verse says it all that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Um, this is a saved believer that's living in a sinful existence. So, so the people out there that are saying, "Well, do homosexuals go to uh, if if a saved homosexual continues in in sin? Are they are they going? What, what about alcoholics? Are they if if an alcoholic is is saved and they continue with their alcoholism, um, that they're you know that that they're actually saved and they're going to go to heaven? Yes, yes. Um, but if they if whatever it is that you're doing, if it's destructive to the flesh, there may be earthly consequences. You can't get by without the earthly consequences. Um, but if you're a saved believer, you've you've believed uh, in what Jesus did on the cross and you really, really believed it, um, then although your your flesh might might uh, be killed, your soul is saved. That's That's the main point I walk away from it what Paul's saying here and it fits the fits what Renee was uh, pointing out as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, um, so, so Paul is, is saying that he's already made a judgment. Now, how did Paul learn about this? Uh, he, he's received a letter or letters and I think he's received these letters from Chloe. So he's taking Chloe's word for it. And uh, he hasn't witnessed it himself, but he apparently trusts Chloe so much that he's, even though he hasn't seen it for himself, he's confident in making a judgment. Uh, and uh, he's also uh, saying that, uh, you you must hand this him over to Satan 
Now, handing over to Satan, what does that really mean? Uh, well, Satan and the enemy as a whole, see, this is, uh, I keep saying this, but I think it's it's uh, strange that uh, um, so many people jump to the conclusion that Satan himself is attacking you as an individual. <laughs> but Satan is not omnipresent. Saint, Satan and God are not two equal opposing fo foes. <laughs> Satan doesn't begin to compare with God. God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, God is omnipotent, and uh, God is all good. And, yeah. and so uh, you can't, you should not think that Satan has the ability to be everywhere and he's, you know, he's able to torment you and other many other people. But no, he, he is, I guess, the leader of demonic forces so maybe he's directing them or maybe they they don't need to be directed but the demonic forces are against us mm. and so the footnote here uh, i'm going to look at the footnote on the amplified um uh in in um five five first corinthians five five the footnote of the amplified reads probably a call for the man to be excommunicated and removed from the safety and blessings of the church. So what it means to turn him over to Satan is, uh, Satan is, uh, he, he, he's, uh, and, and the, the enemy, the forces of evil, they're already at work in the whole world. But what I'm, I don't think Paul is saying, here, I'm giving him, and Satan himself can have him. Uh, no, he's saying he's not, as the footnote here says, I think this is probably a good way of understanding is he's being removed from the safety and the blessings of the church or this congregation. He, uh, so he's on his own. He's not going to get any, any help from anybody in terms of in, for anything in terms of uh, especially uh, the spiritual battle that he's going to be going under now that, that he's not in the congregation. The enemy can do what they will with him. He's not going to be uh, prayed for, encouraged, or, or supported in any way by the congregation. Uh, that's the way I understand the footnote. Uh, the footnote in the in the NABRE on verse five. Let's look at that. It says, "Deliver this man to Satan." Once the sinner is expelled from the church. The sphere of Jesus's lordship and victory over sin, he will be in the region outside over which Satan is still master for the destruction of his flesh. Well, that means the purpose of the penalty is medicinal through affliction. Sin's grip over him may be destroyed and the path to repentance and reunion laid open. With Paul's instructions for an excommunication ceremony here, contrast his recommendations for the reconciliation of a sinner in 2 Corinthians 2, chapter 2. Um, I, I think those footnotes are, are quite good. I think that's how I would uh, um, think it should be understood. Uh, Renee or, or Cripps, uh, you want to say any more about those verses and the yeah. footnotes? Before I wanted we go to uh, confirm what you said, that uh, Satan is not omnipresent. People give him way too much credit. Yeah, and the Satan itself just means adversary, and it's it's ba like you said, taking him out of the blessing and and protection. And, you know, the Old Testament says, "He who what is that verse?" You guys up, he who abides, it, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, dwells in the shadow of the Almighty, or something. So when you come outside of that, now you are open for him to destroy you, and sin opens that door, and that's what Paul's saying. You know, uh, that he, I like how that footnote did say it, explained it. However, I don't like the words excommunication because so many people put a connotation of the Catholic Church taking away your sacraments so that you can't have salvation. Yep. That's the only thing I would clarify that it doesn't, we're not talking about that kind of excommunication. We're talking about disfellowship until he says hey i'm not going to do this anymore because it's given the church a bad name it's given jesus a bad name and you know as, as it 
foretells in Second Corinthians, this is exactly what does happen. It is restored. Yeah, I want to add to it too. Thank you, Renee. I want to add to to what Brother Luke said and also what the footnote said. What Brother Luke said about Satan, absolutely true. Gosh, I, I don't know how many times in my life I've heard people talk about Satan as if everything that happens in their life is done because Satan won't leave them alone. And it's just not the case. Um, he's not able to be everywhere. I like the way that you said that, uh, Brother Luke. They're not on e equal ground. They're not both uh, omnipresent, omniscient, or any of that. You know, only God is capable of doing that. Satan can only be at one place at one time. Now, he has minions. He has people to go out and do his dirty work. But Satan himself uh, can't be in all these different places. And he doesn't read our minds. He doesn't know everything that we think. Um, he's just been around a long time. He has the benefit of watching man uh, and knowing how they uh, work for uh, many, many years. So, yeah, he has some knowledge and he has some power. But compared to, compared to God... Um, it's just not even the same ballpark. And also, I think it's frightening uh, to be in a situation where by my sin, I am cut, cut out of the fellowship of believers. I've finally found a circle of, uh, of people that I trust where we all have the same uh, gospel and we lift each other up and doing these broadcasts. It's, it, it's be like... If I had done something and Brother Luke has to say, well, you know, I'm, I hate to do this, but you can't be part of the broadcast anymore. Or if because of my sin, people that are on the panel at, um, with me on TSL say, uh, well, I, I, we can't, I'm sorry, we can't be part of the broadcast anymore. Um, I shudder to think of that because I take great uh, joy in having people that I can go to, having people pray for me, having people to edify and that edify me. Um, so for me, that's enough to keep me from from doing that. It's a it's a safeguard. So the fact that this guy, uh, by Paul's estimation, should have been cast out, um, you know, apparently, whatever it was that made this guy turn around and stop the behavior. I think it's a big thing to not be part of the fellowship. Now, maybe there are people out there that don't care at all. Uh, but for me, it you know, it's enough. It's enough. And um, it's a safeguard. So when we have these kinds of situations with fellowships set up, it can help us, you know, kind of keep us in line. And also people can see, look at our lives, and be able to come alongside us and say, look, um, I see you in doing some dangerous behavior. Just want you to be careful. It may even stop you from doing something before it's done. Good stuff, Brother Luke. Thank you for your comments. All right. Thank you. Uh, but uh, Sister Paula made a comment uh, that uh, rather than excommunicate, uh, she uh, uses the word disfellowship. And I think that is a better word. The word excommunicate was in the footnotes of the Amplified and the footnote also of the NABRE. So there, it, the word excommunicate is not in the scripture, but the concept uh, uh, of being removed from the, the fellowship or disfellowship is, is there. So I would call it disfellowship. I never use the word excommunicate. If someone had to be disfellowshiped from our uh, congregation, we wouldn't call it, we're excommunicating them. That, that's a Roman Catholic word and a Roman Catholic uh, concept. But the world as a whole does not understand. I'm glad Renee brought this up, but most people think that when um, excommunication is done, that uh, you're out of the uh, the communion. I mean, it means the where if you're having communion together, some people could take it as uh, receiving the sacrament and, and taking holy communion, but. Uh, 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 it could easily also be understood uh, communion is gathering together or congregating. You can't be part of the congregation. That's com you can't commune with, with us. But really, uh, that's really not what is the, the fear of excommunication in Roman uh, theology is exactly what Rene said, because they, they believe salvation is tied to the sacrament of taking the communion. And if you, they the Roman church excommunicates someone, they're not allowed to have that. Therefore, they're definitely going to hell because without that sacrament, they can't they have to continually take that sacrament. Uh, but we know that's not the case. We Last Sunday, we, we had communion together. Uh, the, 
that they we had the the sacrament we we did what jesus said do this in remembrance of me but we didn't attach any supernatural power to it like it somehow it's regenerating us or it's making us it's our sins are being forgiven because of it uh, we do it uh, as a, a ceremony uh, because he told us to do it and to as to remember what he did for us so like baptism uh, the communion is something that we're told to do but it has nothing to do with getting saved or staying saved. It has something to do with, with following the, the, the directions and commands of Jesus. All right, now let's go to uh, the next verse now, the KJV. Let me see, we're on verse, uh, verse six. Verse six in the KJV is, your glory is not good know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump brother Cripps uh yeah um leaveneth uh this is a someone explained this to me so this is a cooking term right when they're when they're making bread yep like oh, well, you want you want Renee to go first? Yeah, go first, Renee, because I've always wanted to understand more about this process, and I'm not a cook. I've never baked a. Yeah, it's uh, when they had the Passover, they were told to make unleavened bread, and so they would make this thin pita type bread mm. because it didn't have any yeast in it. Yeast. Uh, the leaven is just yeast, and a tiny bit makes the bread swell up. Okay. So. Um, the unleavened bread on Passover represents the sinlessness of Jesus. He's our bread of life, so obviously he's the sinless bread. Um, Fantastic. Uh, the bread without leaven. And so uh, leaven is used to represent sin or false doctrine because uh, uh, leaven, uh, when it says beware the leaven of the Pharisees, it's their, uh, their false doctrine, their hypocrisy, their wickedness, mm -hmm. the mixing of truth with lies. And so here, the reference to leaven, I believe, is the actual wickedness of the fornication going on within the church. Right. He talks about it so much. But I also think if we keep looking, it could he could be reminding them uh, uh, to keep the purity, not just in the doctrine, but in their behavior. Wonderful. So when it says... Your glorying is not good no, because you, sh you shouldn't be feeling okay about this because this little leaven, this, what this one man did, yes. dirtying up the entire congregation inside and out. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah I've actually, okay. I've actually tried uh, the unleavened bread. We had a Masonic uh, Jew or not a Masonic. I said Masonic. Um, Masonic. <laughs> Messianic, Messianic Jew. I'm glad I caught that. That wouldn't be good. Messianic Jew visit our church uh, uh, about 20 years ago, and and um, we had uh, communion with the unleavened bread. But I, but I always uh, never having never made it myself. Um, so thanks for explaining that, Renee. So um, yeah, you don't want any any yeast in it if you're trying to make the unleavened bread. Just in the same way that you don't want. Um, uh, rampant sin uh, where everyone knows about it, especially. I mean, they know about it to the point where Paul's heard about it. He's not even uh, physically in that church to begin with. So your 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 glorying in this isn't good. Um, you've you've allowed the sin to go un, unchecked or undealt with, and it's going it's going to lead to uh, problems and consequences if it isn't dealt with. I think it's as simple as that. So. Let me re let me read in the Amplified, and then you can comment further, Crips. Uh, the Amplified verse six is: "Your boasting over the supposed spiritual spirituality of your church is not good. <laughs> Indeed, it is vulgar and inappropriate. Do you not know that just a little leaven ferments the whole batch of, of dough, just as a little sin corrupts a person or, or an entire church? Mm. There you go, Brother Cripps. There you go. Yeah, that's you want to talk more about it. 
Um, I just think it's important. It's important. Um, and this is important in the brick and mortar church. It's important in, in this particular congregation, you know, if there, if there was something going on and it's happened, we've had, uh, people that are come to the live chat that are in, in, uh, you know, that we're aware of that they're, um, doing certain things that uh, if we allowed to be undealt with would cause problems. And um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes you, you have to, um, I like what uh, Bible uh, literus said, um, Paula, I like what she said um, about disfellowship. And I think that's the word that we use a lot of times. So um, overall, that's what Paul's saying. So if you leave it unchecked, uh, then then it's going to um, cause more problems for the rest of you. So don't don't let even a little bit get in. Um, you know, sometimes I don't think we always know. I mean, people do a lot of their stuff in secret. We don't know. But if you watch someone long enough, um, I think the, a lot a lot of times you can see when these things uh, come up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Um you're boasting over the supposed spirituality of your church is not good. Indeed, it is vulgar and inappropriate. So Paul uh, is, follows Jesus's uh, way of saying this spiritual pride and boasting is not acceptable. It's uh, vulgar. God hates your spiritual pride and boasting in, in yourself. Yeah. Um, and then when he says, "Do you not know a little, just a little leaven?" Now I want to read this in the in the um, NABRE for a reason here. So go to verse six in the NABRE, uh, and it says, "Your boasting is not appropriate. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens all the dough?" Uh, okay. So for those of you who don't know about cooking and I've learned to cook the last few years I've had to learn a lot about changing my diet and so I've done a lot of my own cooking and uh, I've, I've learned I can make bread I make a lot of different types of bread even though now I'm a carnivore I don't eat bread anymore of any kind <laughs> but when you make bread uh, it, it, you use re yeast to make the bread rise so um, brother Cripps you don't really need to think uh, Oh, wow, I don't, I don't think I've ever had unleavened bread. I'd like to try that. Will you, have you ever eaten a cracker? A cracker is unleavened bread. Yeah, yeah, I Anytime have. You eat a cracker, yeah. The cracker is unleavened bread. It's, it doesn't rise. There's no yeast to make it rise. Right. But what I really see in this uh, uh, yeast, and there's two things I think I want to say about the leaven and the, the, the rising, is that the rising, if you make bread without leaven, it's flat bread. You put leaven or yeast in it and other things to make it rise, it puffs up. So bread that rises is puffed up. Does that tell us something? It's a picture of being puffed up with self-righteousness, but the unleavened is no self-righteousness. You're not puffed up. Um, but if you want to know what leaven means, I think if you do a word search on leaven, you're going to find somewhere, I think Jesus defines leaven as the false doctrines. If you bring false doctrines in, then you're, you're spoiled. It's like adding leaven. People get puffed up with that false doctrine. Mm. Um, um, if, uh, yeah. if you, I just grabbed my wife, and if maybe you, she's got a pretty good insight as being a home cook she's been trying to share with me about leaven that i just don't understand but i think if she shared it here it might be uh, might help out yeah good thanks go ahead paul hey everybody hey. hi paula <laughs> um i i'm sorry i hadn't been listening to the broadcast i was playing a game with uh my daughters but um yeah, I have a, a interesting theory about leaven. It's actually yeast. It's like yeast. And the purpose of yeast is to puff up. Um, and there's certain conditions that yeast works best in, and that's lukewarm. Mm. And if you put it in cold liquid, it will still work, but it's called a long rise. It takes a very long time for the yeast to work. Um, and if you put it in hot liquid, it'll kill it. Wow. So 
the, the, it's really interesting that God kind of cemented that in my brain as I would um, make bread every week um, and likening the leaven to um, false doctrine and also sin. And if you think about the parable of um, the woman who took and hid uh, leaven in, in three measures of wheat, I think, or, so, or meal or something. Um, often, when I first heard that, uh, I heard preachers say, well, that's Christianity, you know, but it doesn't really make sense. And number one, leaven is always uh, something negative, like sin or false doctrine. And it's not like leaven in and of itself was sin because they cooked with leaven all the time. And that is evidenced by um, during the Passover, they would have to get the leaven out of their house because it's called the days of unleavened bread. Mm. Um, and <clears throat> I always see, think of it like when I see a man that's really puffed up in himself, I can always tell that he has a little bit of leaven in his doctrine. And there is one verse, uh, I can't tell you where it's at, but it talks about um, the sincere unleavened word of truth or something like that. And so I think of it like the true gospel is unleavened. You won't be puffed up mm. uh, because the true gospel um, humiliates man and exalts God. Amen, sister. Wonderful. So I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. That's fantastic. You're welcome. All right. Well, just, just pop in anytime you feel like it, okay? Um, uh, one last thing I'd like to ask regarding this verse here. Uh, when I read it in the Amplified, I'll read it and emphasize something and uh, to try to stimulate your th this thought here. It says, uh, do you not know that just a little leaven ferments the whole batch of dough just, just as a little sin corrupts a person or an entire church? Wow. So some people might wonder, why is it necessary? Uh, well, uh, this is telling us that the whole church can be corrupted with this bad kind of behavior. If it's tolerated, it will spread. You need to remove it just like you have to cut out a tumor and get, get it out. Otherwise, it'll grow in the church. We have proof of that, Brother Luke. We have proof of that with the new age being um, brought in a little bit at a time, witchcraft being brought in a little bit of time to the churches. And now you have, uh, quote unquote, Christian tarot cards, uh, just for an example. You have people that are actually doing things like that in the church, and um, it's being embraced by a certain group of people. Like, it's no problem. No problem getting a, getting a reading with cards, angel cards or whatever. They just changed the name of it, but it's tarot cards. Um, yeah, comes in a little bit of time. Generally, uh, in, in the church, it's not like... Uh, uh, 13 people come in during a church service and just say, hey, let's uh, go out in the woods and dance around the trees naked, worship nature. You know, it comes in subtle, a little bit, a little bit at a time. And one witch can destroy a church. One one person that is practicing witchcraft um, can uh, infiltrate a church and um, they're doing that all over, all over the place. So I think the point can be made by looking at the, the state of the church right now and it, and uh, the, the brick and mortar church, at least the uh, Christianity as a whole, um, to this point. Yeah. Well, um, I personally can relate to uh, the congregation as far as, um, I, I don't know if everybody in the congregation had like a laissez-faire attitude about it. Well, who cares? No big deal. Uh, or could it be that there were some, Chloe was certainly one, because she notified Paul about what was going on. Mm. But there were probably some that were concerned and didn't like it and knew something needed to be done, uh, but maybe didn't speak out and, and, and push the point. And so she, what she did, it seems, is that she didn't confront it them. She contacted Paul, so Paul could deal with it. But Paul's saying, you should be able to deal with this. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to deal with it, but you should be able to deal with this. Yep. Uh, I found it difficult. Uh, and I had a congregation in my home for seven years, and people asked me to deal with uh, some of the other people's problems, issues. And uh, I, I, I don't, in hindsight, I don't know if I did the right thing or not, but I didn't, I didn't deal with it. And, uh, um, but and there, here's the reason, and, and maybe someone can give me some insight on this. Uh, this is obvious. Uh, I guess everybody knows about it. I mean, they're, 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 it's blatant, it's public, there's no shame or there's no attempt to hide it. But the truth is, if everybody was put under a microscope in that congregation and our own, if we all knew all the secret things about each other, even now, none of us would pass this test. The only difference is some of us are keeping our things secret. And uh, But as soon as you come out publicly and displaying something, then I guess the congregation has no choice. It has to be confronted because it's been made known and we can't, we can't condone it. It's it's a, it's a slander against the church itself, brother Luke. I I want to add to that. There is a difference between someone struggling with an issue and someone just blatantly giving themselves over to it without concern. That's a different issue. There are people that have like say for instance addiction, and they hate it. And there there's sometimes sometimes people get sick physically without it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes their brains are chemically addicted to something like pornography, and it takes a while mm-hmm. for, for that to uh, for them to get victory over it. Mm-hmm. But they're working on it, and they need help. That's not the time to disfellowship someone. No, right? We want to be clear that this is not about beating people up as they're trying to grow. No. This is about a saved person doing something openly and without regard and without remorse that's gonna affect and harm the church. We had something similar in a a sister church where the pastor's wife was having an affair with one of the young men. It had to be dealt with. It was destroying and eating the church up from the inside out. So there's a difference. We don't go around, it says to judge people with the same measure we would want ourselves to be judged in these issues. And we have been forgiven as far as eternity goes. But when it comes to judging situations, we should always uh, judge them with compassion and care with the ultimate goal of restoring that person to a healthy fellowship and and an identity, a reminder of who they are in Christ. So if somebody's struggling with something, you don't give them an ultimatum and go, well, if you don't get victory over it, we're just not going to talk to you. That's the wrong thing to do. People need support during those times. This is about blatant disregard without remorse. Big, big difference. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, anything else before we go to the next verse? All right. In the KJV, verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And on to verse eight. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And there's a period there. Thank you, Paul. (laughs) <laughs> uh, uh, Brother Cripps, you want to go first, verse 7 and 8? Yeah, now that I under- have a better understanding of unleavened, I absolutely can go first. So um, he's defining it at the end. I like the way that he does that, neither with the leaven of mouse and wickedness. So there, we have a little more exposition there of what he's referring to in the analogy of uh, how he's using leaven. And then the unleavened bread, he's describing that uh, as well by saying, using the word sincerity and truth. So without even reading the Amplified, this is pretty clear in the King James. Um, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is the way that I want to be as a believer. I want to be sincere. I want to be truthful. I want my to keep my yeas yea, my nays nay, so to speak. Um, we use the terms authentic, uh, open and authentic. Um, 
Uh, and uh, I like to surround myself with people that are like that. Um, so uh, Paul, Paul's definitely highlighting that, and it's good advice. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Purge out there for the old leaven, absolutely. Um, and start over. Start, start fresh. That's what I think of. Start fresh. Um, once you remove the person that's causing all the problems, start over fresh. Now, as we know, if the person uh, turns away and they have a change of mind and they quit doing the thing, then they can be welcomed back into the new lump without that sin, without the, um, the malice or wickedness uh, involved. And they can then again be a part of the fellowship uh, and uh, with sincerity and truth. That's a great verse. I like that last one, especially. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Renee, I'll read it in the Amplified before you comment. Verse 7 and 8 in the Amplified reads, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new batch, just as you are still unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with leaven of vice and malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and untainted truth. Yeah, I want to remind people that this um, keeping the feast, when, when the group, when the churches got together, it was common to celebrate the Lord's Supper. They would get together, they'd make a day of it, and they would actually feast. They would have a whole thing, and he's actually addressing this issue as well uh in this in this book so when it, sorry something broke um so just a moment no. i'm sorry it's a zoo in here uh so when he says purge out the old leaven he's obviously saying you gotta get rid of this kind of person and behavior outside of the church that you may be a new lump so that everything's clean and pure and you can the, the church isn't defiled by it it's not accused and let us keep the feast not with the old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness the old leaven i i uh uh i, I believe is talking about um uh doctrine and sin here because it says neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth obviously a person that's committing this without remorse is not really sincere at the moment and he's not walking in the truth of who he is i, I really think it's about uh it, it it would actually bring condemnation to this man to take up the lord's supper in this state i believe mm. okay i'd like to look at the uh amplified uh, footnote on verse seven. First Corinthians five, seven footnote says, Paul is using the Passover celebration as an analogy. Leading up to the Passover meal was the feast of unleavened bread. See Exodus 12, 17 through 20 during which the Israelites were to remove all leaven from their homes to symbolize the removal of sin from their lives. Leaven, that is yeast, was often used as a symbol of spiritual corruption. Uh, so it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread that Paul is referencing. And if we go to the NABRE for verses uh, 7 and 8, the footnotes there, uh, it says, in the Jewish calendar, Passover was followed immediately by the festival of unleavened bread. In preparation for this feast, all traces of old bread were removed from the house, and during the festival, only unleavened bread was eaten. The sequence of these two feasts provides Paul with an image of Christian existence. Christ's death, the true Passover celebration, is followed by the life of the Christian community, marked by newness, purity, and integrity, a perpetual feast of unleavened bread. Paul may have been writing around Passover time. This is a little Easter homily, the earliest in Christian literature. Mm -hmm. So they're speculating that Paul wrote this around the Passover time, and they're using the word Easter. 
some of us may object to that the the term Easter we we I think we all of us probably call it Resurrection Day uh, maybe if you have a Jewish heritage you re relate to the Passover but uh, we don't usually use Easter I don't think why would we not use Easter uh, Renee well obviously because it's Ishtar the pagan goddess that they worshipped uh and we don't want the focus to be on that now i don't now here's one thing i don't know if the original greek actually used the word easter in the original because it just happened to be a feast of easter that this occurred on or if that word easter was put in there later on through the the translator i'm not sure of that i have to check that out because it does mention the word easter in the king james bible about how he, he rose and it was Easter morning or something like that. So I, I'd have to check on that, the original. Uh, from my yeah. understanding, Easter was uh, the term used for either the last day of the Passover or the first day of the Passover um, particularly. So that, that was, uh, I, from my understanding, the actual word is correct, but it, he didn't rise on Easter. It actually it was speaking of a particular day in that Passover feast time. So I, I knew it was referring to an actual date, like a, a actual. But I I believed that this was in reference to the Hellenized, the paganized Hellenized Jews uh, knew that day because it was a pagan feast based on Ishtar or Easter. So I don't like. I don't know if it's in the original. It is in the original Greek, or you're not sure. Yeah, yeah. it okay. is, okay. It's, but it's okay. not Ishtar. It's but the Easter. The reason why the King James translators came up with it is because it was actually uh, it wasn't talking about resurrection morning. Like it's not even talking about resurrection morning right. in the passage. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it was just a day that specified i think it was the very first day of passover maybe the day that they could tell by looking at the moon or something something to do with the calendar but that's what it was or it might have been the very last day of Passover. I'm right exactly which what it was i i i, I don't know why i want to say this but i still believe easter is the another name or pronunciation for ishtar no i agree, I agree with that i think uh, i think both are correct right they okay. both are. All right. Ishtar and Easter. Um, Easter for the Jews before Ishtar came around was a day in Passover. Ah, the, the Catholics included all the pagan stuff uh, and tried to make Easter into Easter. I so it, it was it was. It's both. It was just a collaborated effort to cause confusion. I got it. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, in the, um, I don't know the subject well enough off the top of my head. I'll try to tell you something that I can recall, but it is a fascinating study uh, of the, the feasts of Israel and understanding the meaning of those feasts, how it relates to our faith. Uh, and uh, it's all relevant. Every one of the feasts have a deep meaning in Christianity, but this one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, uh, well, we know the history of Passover is when uh, uh, Moses was demanding Pharaoh to let the people go, and Pharaoh had refused, and the, all these plagues uh, had come, and Pharaoh continued to refuse, and then finally Moses said that the firstborn will all die unless they're protected by the blood of, of, of the Passover lamb. The lamb a lamb was killed, but everybody had the blood of the lamb spread over the uh, covering of their doorway. Uh, and I've heard it was put on the top and both sides and at the bottom. So that's like his feet, his hands, and his head. The, that was, there was blood. Uh, and uh, that was a picture of Jesus' shed blood and, and uh, that uh, the punishment of sin, death, it passes over us because of our faith, just as death passed over those people at that time because of the blood, which is a picture of this future shed blood of Jesus. Uh, but so that's the uh, significance of the, the, the feast. But I've also heard that the Passover lamb 
At the time, it was actually uh, that the high priest would kill this lamb uh, was the exact moment of the death of Jesus. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, Jesus was born in the actual field where the slaughtered lambs were bred for the temple. That's the place that they bred the yeah. lambs for the temple in this field where he was born. And they inspected Jesus the same amount of days they inspected the lamb. So all the questioning where the Pharisees were trying to trip him up and trick him into sinning or breaking Moses's law or putting him in. Remember when they tried to say, well, who, who should we pay? Do we pay Caesar? Because they were they were always trying to trick him. They were trying to set him up to sin or to break the Mosaic law. And he never did. And for the same amount of days they did that to him, they inspected him. Uh, is the same amount of time that they inspect the lamb. I, I did something in the Old Testament on that and showed the exact amount of time all this was done. It's amazing how specific uh, everything is. Uh, it, you know, the, all the sacrifices were done outside the gate, just like Jesus was killed outside Jerusalem. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Well, I, there is somebody I don't remember his last name now, but he's on TV, and uh, his name is Perry, Perry something, and I believe he's a Pentecostal. Perry Stone. Perry, Perry Stone. Stone. Perry yeah, Stone. Yeah, he's okay, a Pentecostal well, preacher. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I'm not endorsing Perry Stone, to don't anybody who uh, wants to correct me think I am. But uh, on this particular subject, he has some great insights, and I've seen his teaching on all these festivals, and it was really fascinating. Uh, so uh, if you can find his teaching on that, it would be uh, enlightening and helpful to everybody. Uh, any, uh, does anybody else have anything you want to add related to the, the, the Passover of Unleavened, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and this, how it relates to uh, Jesus? Just that he's the bread that came down from heaven and was born in the house of bread, Bethlehem. And uh, he said flat out, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. He's the, the manna in, in the wilderness and the unleavened bread. He's the bread without leaven. He's the sinless bread as well. He, he fulfills all of that. You know, we eat his flesh. He is the bread that came down from heaven. So. Well, and okay. I'll quickly say about the Passover and how directly connected it is to, I think, the Book of Life and how everybody is written in the Book of Life from, I believe, the creation of the world and the fact that God is not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance, that he even proved it by writing their name down in the Book of Life. And just like what we read in Exodus and what's being referred to here, the blood needed to be applied to the lentil that looked like a cross for the angel of death not to come in and kill and when they saw the blood god had the angel of death pass over that house and not go in with the plague of death and so it's the same with the book of life as in god at one day will go down that list and when he sees the blood applied, <coughs> Jesus' blood applied to our name, because we believe on him, he'll pass over our, our name. And those that do not have the blood applied to the lintel of their soul, their spirit, he will blot them out. The, the, the curse of death will come in and they will die the second death. Yep. If you don't have the blood applied to them. And that's through faith. So Amen. it's a great picture of the gospel just from from Genesis to Revelation with the book of life, if you do the study on that and how directly connected it is to this Passover we're talking about. Amen. Yeah. Amen to that. You can say a lot more about that too. Okay, uh, let's go to verse 9 and 10 in the KJV. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. 
for then must ye needs go out of the world. Or an A. Yeah, this is probably for, me. That's like a foreign language the way he wrote that to me. Go ahead. Me because he's telling you know, I, I wrote you a letter and said don't hang out with fornicators. And yet and he said, yet yeah, not all together with the fornicators of the world or with the covetous extortions, idolaters, for then you must need go out of the world. He's saying if if I told you to stay away from all fornicators and idolaters, you'd have to leave the planet. I'm not talking about uh, this world in general. I'm talking, well, you'll see in the next verse, he's talking about within the fellowship. Don't cover. He says, you, you, I, if I were to tell you to not uh, be in the company of a fornicator or an extortioner or an idolater, you'd have to leave this world. You'd have to leave the planet. We're not talking about people outside the church here. You know? saying i'm telling you not to company with these people in the church so mm -hmm. you must yeah. have to leave the world must needs let me see how he says it uh yet not all together with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters for then must ye needs go out of the world so it wouldn't be possible for him uh and then he even addresses this later for him to say you can't ever talk to or be around these people because the whole world is that way you know you'd have to yeah. leave the planet hey brother Cripps, how about if i read it in the amplified for us who uh, must you need to go out in the world it sounds like a foreign language fantastic okay i'll read i'll read nine and ten in the amplified uh, i wrote you in my previous letter not to associate with sexually immoral people not meaning the immoral people of this world or the greedy ones and swindlers or idolaters for for then you would have to get out of the world and human society altogether boom there it is well renee uh lit right on it <laughs> the amplified seems to back renee's uh assertion up uh on that pretty well so yeah so it's simply saying i'm not talking about all of them i'm talking about the ones in your particular group um, he's making another point here of talking about the world being full of all these types of people. And we know that we're not called to that. We're not, you know, not a licensed sin. We're not called to these types of behaviors and it's not appropriate in the church. Um, so I think he's making that point, uh, pretty clear for us. We're not called to change the moral standing of unsaved people either. Right. <laughs> it's like so many Christians are out there trying to, preach against homosexuality and preach against abortion and preach it. These are unsaved people. We're not called to change their behavior. Right. You know? Yeah. Now, uh, it, he, he's saying obviously that uh, you'd have to withdraw from the world yeah. completely if you were trying to avoid being around anybody like this. But we're not supposed to do that. I remember Jesus said to put your lamp under a table, put it on the top of the table, let your light shine. So uh, our uh, Christianity should be obvious to everybody. And everywhere we go, we should stand out like a sore thumb. And we should go in the world. But we're not supposed to be of the world. We're not supposed to be like them. We're supposed to be, as it, the Jews were called, a uh, uh, what kind of people of... Uh, Holy a peculiar, a peculiar, yeah, that's right. We, we should, we're people should uh, relate to us as peculiar. We're not like the world, but we don't withdraw like monks do in a monastery. We are in the world, but we are peculiar because we don't live like them. Uh, and uh, but here's a in, in the amplified this this should stand out is his. I wrote you in my previous letter. Now, wait a second, isn't this 1 Corinthians? We know there's 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but there is a previous letter. Yep. And this yeah. previous letter is lost. As far as, as far as my studies have gone, there is a prior letter, but it's lost. I'd love to, everybody would love to know what he said in there exactly. He's, he says that he wrote this part in it, but who knows what else he told him. Right. I'd like to see the letter that first John's responding to. Wow. Yeah. See that letter. That's yeah. what I do. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's look at the, is there a footnote anywhere in the, uh, 
9 and 10, 9 through 13. Well, I'll get to that footnote uh, later. Let's go back to the KJV for verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one no not to eat brother cripps yeah matthias brought this up the other night i forget what show it was on i think it was monday's milk but um talked about this very thing uh oh it was on tsl actually about eating with um you know that uh we're told not to eat even eat with people like this um and paul's making a very particular so the verse uh, the verses we read above are saying not talking about people in the world I'm talking about people in the fellowship and then he makes it even more clear i've already written to you not to keep company if any man be called a brother there's the point that should be underlined and um and, and put in bold letters. So we're talking particularly about someone that's a brother or sister. Um, if they're uh, living in these types of behavior, uh, continual, continual, over and over and over again uh, kind of uh, situations, um, we're not even supposed to eat with them. But when they quit, then again, I keep going back to this because it's important when they quit, when they turn uh, away from it and uh, they have a change of mind, then they're restored back to fellowship. That's important. Um, and then we can uh, welcome them back in. You've gained a brother. You go to him, uh, you know, and you talk to him about the behavior. And then you take a couple people with you. You know, we've talked about that. Um, and they can be restored back to fellowship, though. Yeah. All right, Renee, let me read it in the Amplified before you go uh, on. It says... But actually, I have written to you not to associate with any so-called Christian brother if he is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater, that is, he's devoted to anything that takes the place of God, or is a rev reviler who, that is, who insults or slanders or otherwise verbally abuses others, or is a drunkard or a swindler you must you must not so much as eat with such a person and there is a footnote here oh but i'll get to that after you talk go ahead sister i got a big problem with that translation because they're trying to yeah, I do, that I do person too. might not so be called. christian no yeah, so called it doesn't say so called paul never I know. paul never uh uh questions whether the man's saved or not he's questioning whether he's living out his faith so i this this kind of stuff is very subtle and it makes me angry because that's not what the word says it clearly says but i have written to you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother so this is obviously a believer a saved person and he's called a brother why is he called a brother because he's a brother it's not saying that he's not that he's a so-called brother because that implies that he's not one you can't trust christ and not be a brother it's oh it just makes me that made me so mad if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covenant proves right here that you can be saved and live just as wickedly as the world we're not supposed to nobody's condoning it but this is an unfortunate reality and you don't ignore that reality and just tell them they're unsafe well renee why would paul go to the, what why would paul go to the point to talk about the fornicators and whatnot in the world if he's not making the point that here he's talking about a brother thank you well, well, actually clear i'm talking about people within the body of christ right right i see i don't necessarily I get where they're going, and I think the NABRE may say it better when we go to it. But I think it's more speaking of we give this discipline to anybody who claims to be a brother, whether they're a false convert or not, whether they, if they themselves are named or claiming to be a brother, even if we don't think that they actually really believe what they're saying or they even have a false gospel. 
but they're naming Christ and they're a fornicator, you would still give them the discipline, the discipline. So I would say that like, you know, cause we don't know who is saved or not. So just if anybody yeah. is claiming Christ and they are not acting the way or what he, what Paul's saying here, then we treat them the same, whether they truly are saved or not. If they're claiming to be, to be a Christian, whether we're confident in their confession or not, still don't eat with them if they're a fornicator. Right, to break don't eat with them. With it. Co but correct. anything in Paul's verbiage there that implies they might not really be one. I don't want to put that there because it's not here. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying not that he's, uh, not that he's saying that because of their actions that they might not be a Christian. It's saying that it doesn't matter. Still break fellowship. Exactly. As long as they are claiming the name of Christ as being a Christian, you know, whether they are saved or not, you still give them yeah. right. brotherly that's, discipline. That's perfectly yeah. fine. Uh, but I, I don't I don't I don't like that the places in scripture that show that saved people are just as capable of being in the flesh if they're not properly discipled or they're not working towards growing in their faith. Uh, they just throw them out and say they're just not saved at all. And, that, and it's well, just nonsense. Here's all right. 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 Anybody. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to get two, two cents right in on this. This right. is really interesting. When I read the Amplified, uh, uh, and I, I didn't respond, but my mind was shocked as yours was, Renee. And I was thought, well, that's not there at all and i was objecting to it as, as you were uh, arguing against it and and, uh, and that's why what we do is we we read the kjv and then we look at other translations and some and many times it's helpful sometimes we see a difference that is significant and we test it against the kjv and at least that's my position but uh I think Matthias's point, and especially when you do look at the NABRE, but also you don't even have to go there. If you look back at the KJV again, the way it's written, it's pretty interesting. It, let me read it in the KJV again. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. So here he's not saying that is a brother, he's saying that he's called a brother uh, earlier, I know there is a distinction. He's talking about people who are believers and people who are not believers. And so there, he's identifying that he's talking about a person who's a believer. We're supposed to judge them. If they're not a believer, then it's none of our business. But in this case, he's saying one who is called a believer. So I believe there is room in the KJV to ta also take that position that we should not assume that everybody that's doing this is actually a brother just because they are identifying themselves as a brother. And in the NABRE, as Matthias says, uh, we should look at it. He sa it says, but I now write to you not to associate with anyone named a brother. Uh, uh, but there's more I want to say about that, about this verse here. There's a lot uh, the other subjects that were important in this verse, but uh, the idea of whether they're a brother or not, we don't know. But we're treating them as a brother, because if they weren't a brother, we wouldn't care. <laughs> we're considering them, okay, they say they're a brother, so they got to, they got to be disciplined and, and disfellowship. Yeah, that's what Jason was so, saying. He's saying, why would he distinguish the world from within the church? So it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we're, 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 there, there may be some doubt. Uh, who knows? He's identifying himself as a brother. It says in the KJV, he's called a brother. Uh, so uh, he very well may be a brother, maybe not. I, we can't ju make that judgment, but he identifies himself as a brother, and therefore he has to follow under this system of, of uh, disfellowship uh, people who are in the congregation. They have to be removed if they're behaving in this way. Now, my question for everybody is let's look at uh, the Internet. Let's look at YouTube. Let's look at our congregation. Let's look at some other congregations and other YouTubers that we know. And uh, this is what really gets to me, is that I actually observe people I know in our congregation, and yet they are, as it says here in verse 11, in the, uh, it, it says, with such a one, you don't even eat with them. 
but in the a amplified it says uh, uh, let me see where is it verse 11 um, okay um, de devoted anything that takes the place of okay uh, you must not so much as eat with such a person and the footnote if you go down to the footnote on, on the amplified on verse 11 it says in ancient times eating together was an open display of friendship and acceptance of one another uh, so when, when we go uh, and have joined other uh, congregations that are behaving like this I often wonder what what inspires some of us to join in other I guess we'll, I'll call them fellowships. I question a lot about what it really is. But these people are uh, revilers. As a matter of fact, it says, uh, uh, I'm not even talking about being sexually immoral or idolaters, but a reviler. That's someone who insults or slanders or otherwise verbally abuses others or is a drunkard. Now, I've seen people on YouTube uh, promoting drunkenness, promoting drinking. Uh, now, nothing's wrong with drinking uh, as long as you don't get drunk, but promoting it and and then also being verbally abusive to others, slandering others. We know people like this. We're not, not supposed to take part in it. If we join them at any time, we are uh, breaking, we're violating this command of Paul here that we are not supposed to associate with these people. And not having breaking bread with them is just a, a, a picture of just not having anything to do with them, not even breaking bread with them. And look at the look at the uh, let's look at the NABRE's footnote on verses nine through thirteen. It says Paul here corrects a misunderstanding of his earlier directives against associating with immoral fellow Christians. He concedes the impossibility of avoiding contact with sinners in society at large, but urges the Corinthians to maintain the inner purity of their own community. So not only this congregation uh, do we have to um, abide by this, uh, but we, if we uh, entertain in, uh, the thought of, of uh, engaging with other groups, we have to apply this also. Are we joining groups who are, as it says here, uh, reviling? Uh, reviling what stands out to me because that's what I see. I'm not seeing people in other congregations um, blatantly being drunk and stealing and and, uh, and uh, fornicating. We don't know. Maybe someone's doing it in secret and we don't know about it. But what I am seeing is a lot of public um, insulting and slandering, verbally abusing others. We had someone coming in here tonight that had to be corrected in the in the chat room who was trying to do that very thing, slandering somebody and uh, slandering us by saying that someone else was accused of something. So that, that kind of behavior, we need to disassociate from them. Not only in this congregation, but we dare not join other groups if they're engaging in that. And yet I see it being done. And it, it really shocks me when I see some of in our congregation uh, fellowshipping with people who are behaving in a hateful uh, manner that is condemned in these verses here. Uh, now I'm going to go to verse 12 and 13 to finish up, but uh, be anything, anything more from anybody here? Yeah, I, I just want to say that if, if someone is reading this okay, particular... Next... What? What? Can you hear me? Can anybody yeah, can hear, hear me? You. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you, buddy. Yes, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Well, I thought you said something. Maybe you didn't want me to to comment. So no, nobody said anything. Okay. No, no, nobody said anything. Okay, so you're hearing voices in your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. Um, just this particular chapter alone. If someone's reading this and and they're saying or, or they're trying to put the words so-called believer in here, then they're ignoring the all the verses from the very first one. 
the way that Paul set this up, he makes it very clear that the person he's talking about in the verses that we read and talking about the giving over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that he would be saved, that he's talking, Paul at least, is calling him a believer. So all this, the, I mean, I agree with what everyone's saying, but I'm saying that if a person out, outside of us is, is reading this and using it in some way to, uh, to uh, imply or suggest that uh, Paul's not calling him a believer or he's not called a believer or he is not a believer, then they're not reading the whole the whole letter in context. That's all I wanted to add. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that was my first impression. Yeah. And then when Matthias brought up the, the point uh, uh, and I reread the KJV, um, when it says, if any man that is called a brother, uh, I think that there is uh, some validity in that also. Uh, let's yeah. go to verse 12 and 13. Okay. Uh, 12 and 13 in the KJV. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Brother Cripps, you want to go first? Yeah, so he's, he's just making the point even more clear for what what Paul's saying, what do I have to do with judging people that aren't in the in the fellowship, that aren't Christians, that aren't part of the uh, of 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 our group. Um but them that are without, God judges. So he's saying God's God's gonna uh, do to them what he's that like he's gonna judge the wicked. Like we know when, when Christ comes back, he's he's coming back to judge the wicked. That's that's one of the purposes of his return. Um, so we don't have to worry about them. We don't have to be concerned with them. God's going to take care of them. Um, again, the whole reason why Paul's writing this particular chapter, this particular letter, is in relation to this particular person that um, he said from the beginning that they did not deal with appropriately, and they're trying. Uh, Paul's trying to uh, show them how he should have been dealt with um, for the future and uh, taking care of the, the, the issue uh, in that way. Which the result is All right. remove him. Okay. Uh, Renee, I'm going to read verse 12 and 13 in the Amplified for you. Uh, for what business is it of mine to judge outsiders, that is, non believers? Do you not judge those who are within the church to protect the church as the situation requires? God alone sits in judgment on those who are outside the faith. Remove the wicked one from among you. Expel him from your church. That's pretty darn plain simple, Renee. Boom. Yeah, I, I, again, I want to remind it. I, I do not understand why Christians make these big protests against ungodly behavior of, of the unbeliever. I, I just don't. Because I, I keep telling people, what do you care what Satan's kingdom's doing? We got to deal with what the kingdom of God's doing. That's what we deal with here. And the cure to all that out there is the gospel. So they stop being out there and then bring them in and then God can work on that. So um, what for what do I have to do to judge them also that are without? Like you said, you'd have to leave the whole planet if you're going to stop fellowshipping with wicked people. Do not you judge them that are within. Again, we're just judging within those in Christian, you know, within the church. But them that are without, God judges, therefore put away from among you that wicked person. So uh, the, the only judgment us as Christians can make are within our realm of authority, within our own community, within the body of Christ. And even then, we're not judging them for eternity or condemning them. We're disassociating from them because they cause damage to the name of Jesus. And hopefully it will turn that person back to remembering who God said he made them to be. Well, I, I thought of one question I wanted to ask earlier, and I just remembered it. And then it, Paul has this list. And on the list he has fornicator, this, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner. 
Uh, do you think that's a complete list? Of the sin in the outside world? <laughs> or the things we should judge, you mean? I think it well, is. Uh, oh, no, he, he's, I, he's talking about... Uh, uh, no, uh, I was say, I'm I talking was about it. He's given us a list. If the person's doing these things uh, and he uh, says he's a believer, then we're to take action. So, oh, yeah. But is, is there other things that should be on the list, or is this a full list? I think it's a full list. I think it's a full list of what we should do for the discipline. If they're not an extortioner, a railer, a fornicator, a drunkard, if they're not one of those, then we can still associate with them and try to help them out uh, by coming alongside them. But if they are anything on this list, we have to obey God and just put a stop to our fellowship with them. Well, what, if they were, well, what if someone was a murderer? I mean, I, you don't think murder should right. be? Right. I was going to say fornication is just one of the really sexually immoral things. So I'm... I, I mean, I think I think that would be left to each church's judgment based on the behavior. I don't think we need a full list to know what's godly behavior and what is not. Yeah, you know? yeah. That, that the way I understand this is that these are examples of the of many. And he said, if you wrote down everything, he had to write down a thousand things. But, uh, I don't think Matthias. I was surprised you said that. Uh, what? It's interesting point of view, but uh, uh, I was saying it almost as a rhetorical question, thinking that oh, everybody's going to say, "Of course, it's not the full list." I do. Uh, think uh, Crips are, what, what do you think? All right, go ahead. If you want to say more, Matthias, go ahead. Then I'll ask Crips. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was I was just saying I I do think it's a full list on the fellowship part. So if somebody were a murderer, or an uh, I mean adultery is fornication. Um, it's, uh, but if, if somebody was in sin, um, uh, particular sin that was not on the list, I wouldn't disfellowship them. But if they were one of those things, I would say that God has told me to. And if I don't disfellowship you, then now I'm under, uh, the possibility and good chance of being chastised for not listening to this command that I'm supposed to obey. So I, I wouldn't think now if you want to disfellowship with somebody because of the murder, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily wrong, but I wouldn't say that you would get chastised from God for not disfellowshipping a murderer like you would yeah. an extortioner. It's interesting. I uh, I would have uh, I think that, that Paul just gave us some examples and and, and it. it and it's a limited list because if he wrote down everything you could think of, it would just go on and on and on. But uh, um, Cripps, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I agree with what you just said. I mean, it, it, this is he's dealing with an, uh, a situation with um, uh, naming a few things on the list. And I, I think to all of us, I mean, we've heard the other things that have been mentioned before that are considered uh, grievous uh, sins. And murder would be included in that. Um, lying, you know, uh, 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 false witness and, you know, anything. Um, but I have to go with what's being said here. And But I would use common sense. Like, you know, if would I hang out with a murderer, someone that's a known murderer, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, 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 you know, if it's a serial killer, if I know someone's a serial killer and, um, you know, maybe maybe I'm not their type, I don't fit their MO, but I still probably wouldn't hang out with them. Does I don't need him to to list it in the list for for me to know not to hang out with certain types of people. All right. Well, that's a uh, it's a very short chapter, only thirteen verses, and there's a lot of uh, uh, meat in it. Yeah, it's really very very interesting chapter. But uh, that com completes the chapter, and and that completes the time for tonight. But so let me ask. Uh, the chat room if if you have a question or a statement that you want us to respond to maybe we can take a minute and answer that otherwise we're going to sum up our thoughts and let me have brother Cripps go first so i don't forget him <laughs> Cripps, <laughs> would you give us 
Could you give us a, a summary of, of your thoughts on the time tonight? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was a good discussion. I like all the the uh, extra stuff I learned uh, specifically about the yeast and, and unleavened uh, stuff and how that uh, works in. Um, something I've had a question about for a while. Um, I thought I understood it, but I didn't know it's uh, specifically yeast, and so it makes sense. Um, but yeah, uh, just it was a short thing. There is a lot of meat there, and um, I think we touched on everything very well. The bottom line is um, uh, examples from Paul about how we should deal with, with these types of situations uh you know he's saying don't be puffed up that's that's important for us not to be puffed up in our own pride and um he he goes to uh goes a long way to make that point um clear um and the other point that's clear is uh about a saved person uh the possibility of them still living in some sort of sin and turning them over to satan that his flesh might be destroyed, but he would still be saved. I think that's huge uh, for the people that are on the outside that are trying to say that you can lose your salvation or, you know, if you, if we can't tell that you, you've you changed in some way um, that you aren't saved and things like that. So I think it's an important chapter. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a good summary, brother. Thank you. Uh, Sister Renee? Yeah, I'm a case on this, man. I I love this chapter because I've seen people really try to just twist this chapter to say things it doesn't. And it's clear to me, not just here, but all over Scripture, that a person of God can commit just as bad fleshly things as the unsaved can. Uh, However, we're called to be different. We're called to be separate, set apart. Like you said, Brother Luke, like Israel was a peculiar people. We are supposed to be different. We're supposed to be the one, the boss is shocked when he leaves and comes back, surprises everyone else. And we're just as as hardworking as we were when he left because we know that we're answering to God uh, and that God sees all things and he's instructed us to do this, not be deceitful or to steal time and so forth. Um, so uh, it, it just it's it's important also for people when we're given instructions like this it's important that they go on to read the second uh, letter in the book of Corinth because um, uh, the church of Corinth because when a person is restored we are supposed to show we're not supposed to overwhelm a person with guilt and condemnation uh, once they've done that, it's in their past, and we receive them with open arms. Um, so I, I don't want people to think this is like harsh. What we're trying to do is to keep to, for one, uh, not have damage come to to the church. That the church won't be accused in it or given a bad name. That Jesus's name is not blasphemy. That God's name is blasphemy, and also to remind that person of the bondage that sin actually is. It's bondage. And, and Christ came to set the captives free. And, uh, and and that we need to know who we are and to walk in that. We don't, we don't get victory over these things in our lives by being told we just weren't saved to begin with or we lack something, but by being reminded of who God says we are in Jesus. You know, uh, but if someone is completely gone that far, then there has to be consequences. And hopefully it's to save that person's life. Hopefully it'll get so ugly because if you're a child of God, you're not going to get away with it on this earth. You're going to have consequences. Hopefully the, the, the ultimate thing is to keep the church uh, uh, a place of refuge that's different from the world that people can come to for comfort and answers, you know, um, and that ultimately people are restored. That That's what it's about. It's about healing and salvation and forgiveness and mercy and um, not about self-righteousness. And please thank Paula for sharing her revelation with us, Matthias. I will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um,
I'm not seeing anything uh, in the chat room that we need to respond to. Uh, if you do, then you should put it in all caps. But yeah, a good summary by both of you. Thank you. Uh, um, I think what really stands out to me tonight is the, um, you know, there. I made a video about uh, the top five reasons people reject Christianity. Uh, probably a 10, 15, 20 minute video or something a few years ago. And, uh, and, and one of it is that uh, the Christians are constantly judging. We were, there's a lot of things on the list of things we do that people don't want to have anything to do with Christianity because of the way we are uh, generally. Uh, it's a stereotype, but many of the stereotypes against uh, Christianity, is uh, it's, it turns out it's, it's true. Uh, we tend to, to judge. And, and here, I hope everybody learns from this study tonight, let's not judge the lost. I mean, we can tell them what the Bible says and, and tell them what sin is, but it's, it's not our, our judge, uh, our job, as it says to Paul, God's going to judge them. But it is our job to um, do this uh, among ourselves, uh, our congregation, our believe, group of believers, that uh, we have a duty to do it. And uh, I, I hope this, um, this point I'm making here gets through to everybody, that uh, uh, if some things are not... Uh, as as uh, blatant because people are not fornicating right in front of us on on YouTube. Uh, they're not be, being drunkards as a rule on YouTube. But some other kind of behavior, uh, re revilers, uh, people getting hateful, calling everybody names and accusing and all that kind of stuff. I see that going on, and that's being a reviler. We're not supposed to uh, allow that in the congregation. And if you join another congregation that routinely does that, then you're to blame. You should not be doing it. But I see it being done and it's, uh, I don't, I can't understand that. So that's what sticks out to me. I hope people will learn from this study tonight and apply it. Uh, see, there's, there's knowledge and then there's understanding. Understanding is greater than knowledge and that means you comprehend what you've learned. And then, and then, uh, and then there's wisdom. Wisdom is applying your knowledge and understanding, applying it. So if we, uh, if we get the knowledge of these scriptures, if we understand the message, but if we fail to apply it, then we we're lack wisdom. All right. So uh, um, don't forget to join Brother Cripps tomorrow night. He's doing a uh, a testimony for on somebody. Dennis. Maybe you'll say who it is again, but. Dennis, oh good, very yeah. good. I'll be very interested in, in uh, listening to that, and uh, uh, and don't forget to join us Friday for Fellowship Friday at nine thirty p.m. Eastern time, uh, right here. Okay, uh, and Brother Matthias, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, yeah, I know you've been listening and paying attention and getting those scriptures up right when we need them. It was a great study. I enjoyed it. Nothing. Uh, okay. Always right. good to go into God's word. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, all right. Thanks for everybody for participating. See you next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.